Welcome to the Own Your Family, Family, where real stories and proven formulas are shared about leaving the rat race so you can achieve freedom and spend more quality time with your family. Hi, it's Katrina for Own Your Family. In this episode, let me share with you the book summary of The Ultimate Sales Machine by Chet Holmes. The Ultimate Sales Machine is a U.S. bestseller written by Chet Holmes. The book gives a step-by-step guide for implementing the sales strategy and achieving success in sales. You get complete training for implementing the sales strategy and how to achieve success. What I really like about this book is that it is not only written for just salespeople. It is for every person who is associated with some sales activities. You can be a manager or a marketer or a developer. You will get excellent marketing techniques you can use in your work. The Ultimate Sales Machine by the late great sales guru, Chet Holmes, is rooted in a simple premise that mastery isn't about doing 4,000 things, but about doing 12 things 4,000 times. Hence, it's no surprise that Holmes' wonderful little book is dedicated to 12 key business strategies, each of which is exhaustively examined and resourcefully relayed in step-by-step guides. Most people think that mastery is the upshot of talent and knowledge, even as a kid studying karate. Chet Holmes found out that it is actually a direct result of pig-headed discipline and determination. More precisely, he realized that becoming a master of karate was not about learning 4,000 moves, but about doing just a handful of moves 4,000 times. Well, why should business be any different? Indeed, just like earning a black belt, Building a successful company is never about doing 4,000 things, but about doing several things 4,000 times each. In The Ultimate Sales Machine, Holmes goes over 12 such things that, in his opinion, should get, get you all the tools you need to become a master of three crucial areas in business, marketing, management, and sales. So, get ready to learn how to outsell, outmarket, and outmanage your competition in 12 simple strategies. Number 1. Time Management How to Maximize Your Productivity Do you have too many of those 5-minute meetings which take a lot longer to even begin? Well, it's time to put an end to them, and it's time you started each and every one of your days by already knowing what you want and need to do for the day. This is just the outline of the six fundamental steps to great time management. Here they are in order. Number one, touch it once. Make instant decisions when choices first appear. Don't revisit them. In Holmes' words, if you spend just 15 minutes per day to revisit, readdress, or reread documents or emails, you will waste 97 hours per year where no action is taken. In the majority of cases, even a bad action is better than no action at all. Number two, make list. If you don't keep list to keep yourself organized, chances are you are a very reactive person. The problem with reactive people is that they are, by definition, not focused. And success is all about laser sharp focus. That's where to do lists help. However, the key to being productive is to stick to only the six most important things you need to get done in a day. So, don't make long lists, they will only distract you. Number three, plan how much time you will allocate to each task. Rather than thinking about when you will do each of your tasks, determine how much time it will take you. Be realistic. 
then try to work within your self-determined limit. Number four, plan the day. Now that you know what are the six most important things for the day and how much time each should take you, it's time to translate that into a definite schedule. Bear in mind that your plan shouldn't include just the six items on your list, but also miscellaneous things such as checking email and got a minute meetings. The goal, however, is to allocate a time slot for everything and to stick to your schedule no matter what. Number five, prioritize. According to the Pareto Principle, 80% of your results are being driven by 20% of your efforts. So don't be a busy person like George Constanza in that famous Seinfeld episode. Instead, start dropping activities that contribute little to your main objective while consuming a lot of your time. Remember, the goal is not to be busy, that is to say, to be productive. And number six, ask yourself, will it hurt me to throw this away? How do you prioritize best? By asking yourself, what's the consequence by eliminating something? By doing this, not only will you reduce information clutter, but you will also increase your focus and concentration. Number two, consistent training. How to reprogram your organization. According to an article in Harvard Business Review, only 10% of the population has what it's called a learning mindset. Otherwise, put 9 out of 10 of your employees will probably never get interested into improving their skills unless that is part of their job requirement. Would you want to be operated upon by a surgeon who hasn't looked at a medical text in 20 years? Then, why would you allow your company to be run by people who aren't required to get better by the day? Rather than being an interference, training is essential. According to Holmes, developing a regular and consistent training program will enable you to effectively and systematically accomplish at least the following three things. First of all, it will make all of your new employees feel far more comfortable from the very first day. Secondly, it will help your existing employees be more in sync with each other, thereby eliminating misunderstandings and all related issues. Finally, training makes everything more efficient by helping everyone do whatever they are doing better, smarter, and faster. With consistent training every week in every area of your company, write homes. You can put higher and higher standards into place and raise the bar of performance for your entire staff. If you already want to become the ultimate sales machine, training is an absolute must at every level, no matter how large or how small you might be. To round things off with a memorable adage by Holmes, either train or feel the pain. Number three, effective meetings. How to become a finely tuned machine. Every company has meetings, but very few companies have productive meetings. However, if you want to grow your business into the ultimate sales machine, you must find a way to hold regular, highly productive workshop style meetings, involving every relevant employee at every stage and fully dedicated to improving every aspect of your business. The goal of an effective meeting is to turn plans into procedures and procedures into policies. These three Ps, plans, procedures, policies, are the three essential tools of great management because they create the right conditions for the streamlining and automation of processes. Put otherwise, when there are carved in stone company policies, every person in your staff knows what to do in every situation, thereby th turning your company into a well-oiled machine. 
There are a variety of training methods and tools you can use during these workshop styled meetings. They can come in a lecture format or in the form of demonstrations, group discussions, or role playing. Either way, the goal is to include everyone and to encourage questions, jokes, insights, participation, and humor. Remember, progress is only possible in the presence of regulated freedom. Number four, brilliant strategies. Getting up to nine times more impact. There are two ways to sell things, tactically and strategically. To understand either, you must first understand the difference between two words that are often used interchangeably, tactic and strategy. So let's explain them first. To use Holmes' definitions, a tactic is a method or technique used to achieve an immediate or short-term gain. Whereas, a strategy is a carefully defined and detailed plan to achieve a long-term goal. So, a strategy is pretty much a series of tactics that share a similar objective. Or even better, tactics are the specific steps you undertake to accomplish your long-term strategy. Now, most executives say 90 out of 100 are tactical executives. In other words, they do little more than instructing their salespeople to do anything in their power to earn them money as soon as possible. So the salespeople send direct mail pieces to get leads, go on sales calls to make sales, or attend trade shows to meet with potential buyers. The problem in these are all just haphazard tactics. Strategic executives, which are no more than 9 in 100, know better. Rather than thinking only in terms of making the sale for today, they think of developing a high-level strategy that may help them make a sale each day for the next few months. Hence, they disregard tactics altogether and spend a lot of time creating concepts and ideas. Unfortunately, rarely do they know how to implement them. Which brings us to the top 1% of executives. These are the most effective of the bunch because they can both think and plan like strategies and implement like great tacticians. In Holmes' experience, one of the most strategic things these executives do is finding market data that makes their product or service more important. In other words, the best of the best executives see selling as something more than just selling. That is to say, as a subcategory of education. Hence, if you want to build the ultimate sales machine, you must stop seeing your company as a money generating endeavor and start thinking of yourself as an educator, a mentor, an authority. Number five, hiring superstars, building the ultimate sales team. If you want to have the ultimate sales machine, you need to have the ultimate sales people as well. Holmes calls these people superstars and describes them as those you can put in a bad situation with poor tools, no training, and bad resources, and still, within a few months, they will begin to outperform your best people or build your company in ways you never dreamed possible. How do you hire them? According to Holmes, it's not about luck, but about understanding the personality characteristics that fit the job for which you are hiring and having the tools to identify the candidates that possess those characteristics. Hence, personality profiling is the key to finding superstars. The best method to do it is the DISC personality test, which examines the relations between four aspects of one personality, dominance, influence, steadiness, and compliance. Depending on the position you're hiring for, you will need to be aware of different combinations between these traits. 
But as far as salespeople are concerned, it's best to hunt for highly assertive people who combine high influence with high dominance. They are the only ones who can simultaneously keep selling even after a rejection, while bonding like crazy with a buyer. How to hire such a superstar seller? It's not that difficult really, just integrate rejections and challenges in the hiring process. Only a superstar seller fixed in their goals and determinant in their objectives will be able to face rejection after rejection and keep trying again and again and again. To draw out the superstars, use a three-part interview structure, relax, probe, and finally attack. Whoever survives wins. Number six, the dream 100. One strategy to rule them all. When American billionaire investor Charlie Munger put Holmes in charge of ad sales for one of his magazines, the magazine had a database of 2,200 potential advertisers. After doing a bit of market analysis, Holmes realized that 95% of the advertising in the top four magazines in the niche were bought by 167 advertisers. To his dismay, he next found that none of these advertisers were in Munger's magazine. Hence, it wasn't difficult for him to understand why the magazine's market share was considerably smaller than that of its rivals, and moreover, continuously dwindling. By focusing intently on those 167 buyers, Holmes was able to get a few of them in his first year he managed to double the advertising sales of the magazine. He repeated this feat the following year. By the end of the third year, he had brought in most of these 167 buyers. Are you sure we're not lying, cheating, and stealing? Munger asked Holmes. After all, in all my years, I've never seen anybody double sales three years in a row. Naturally, Holmes replied that he wasn't doing any such thing. He was just using a better strategy to market and sell. He calls this strategy the Dream 100. The Dream 100 is deeply rooted in the Pareto Principle. If some buyers buy more, faster, and more often than other buyers, then aren't they worth that much more the effort? Of course, they are. In numbers, if 20% of the buyers buy 80% of the products in your niche, then you can do no wrong if you spend 100% of your time and effort to get them. That's what the Dream 100 is all about. The goal of the strategy in Holmes' explanation is to take your ideal buyers from I've never heard of this company to what is this company I keep hearing about. To think I've heard of that company, to yes, I've heard of that company, to yes, I do business with that company. How do you do that? We'll get to it in a few minutes. Number seven, marketing properly. The seven must of marketing. Every company that wants to be number one in its industry must employ the following seven weapons of marketing. First, Advertising. There are four rules for creating high response generating advertising. First of all, it must be distinctive. Secondly, it must capture attention with a screaming headline. Third, the body of your copy must focus on your prospect, not on you. Finally, your copy must include a call to action. Second, direct mail. Direct mails will only work if you are regular and consistent. If you decide to use them, try to use color as much as possible to make your message more attractive. Even more importantly, try putting your main message on the envelope. Finally, make that message benefit-oriented and focus on the prospect. Third, corporate literature. Under corporate literature, Holmes includes brochures and all kinds of promotional pieces. To use them to their maximum potential, once again, means to align them with your prospect's deepest needs and expectations. 
So don't use brochures to say just who you are. Use them to say why you are a solution to the problems your prospects have. Next, public relations. Public relations include everything from press releases to show parties, from getting articles written by or about you to building relationships with journalists and community groups. Needless to add, the last one is the most important. In the 21st century, networking isn't just a tool for opening doors. It's also a way to do business. Next, personal contact. According to Holmes, personal contact is the most potent form of marketing. In his words, none of your marketing efforts will have as much impact on your client as personal contact with your salespeople or customer service reps. We've got market education. Market education is all about trade shows, speaking engagements, and education-based marketing. Done properly, they can take you from obscurity to the top in a single event. There are only three rules to preparing a great trade show. Get noticed, drive traffic, and capture leads. And lastly, Internet. In 1995, only 5 million people used the Internet. By the end of the second millennium, the number jumped to about 100 million people. Nowadays, virtually everyone uses the Internet for everything. Hence, there are many people specialized books on the subject. But in Holmes' opinion, they all boil down to the following. Five-pronged approach. Capture leads, build a relationship, interact as much as possible, offer a webinar, convert traffic to sales, and everything else is an unnecessary complication. Number eight, visuals and presentations attract and close more buyers. Leonardo da Vinci believed that the eye embraces the beauty of the whole world. Indeed, 85% of the information taken into the brain enters through the eyes. Moreover, humans remember only 20% of what they hear, 30% of what they see, and over 50% of what they both hear and see. Use these factoids to prepare the presentation of your prospect's dreams. A simple graph may relate thousands of sentences in a single second. A PowerPoint presentation is more effective than a whiteboard, but a few short and funny clips can do an even better job. Use a lot of color and different, lively fonts. Use a lot of images as well. Photos of people are particularly effective. Finally, when presenting, follow these four rules. Number one, KISS, K-I-S-S. -S. Keep it simple, stupid. Whatever the topic, your presentation must be easy to follow and understand. Just think of all those TED Talks on quantum mechanics. Do you really think the presenters know as little as their presentations relay? Of course not. But they know they must keep it simple for their listeners. Number two, KIFP, keep it fast paced. It's the 21st century, so everybody has the attention span of a goldfish. Spend too much time on one page and prospects will get too bored. As a rule of thumb, try covering two to three panels a minute. Number three, use wow facts and stats. Factual information, especially at the beginning of a presentation, create a sense of credibility. Wow, wow facts create something even better, a sense of amazement. They keep people interested and give them something to remember. So your goal should be to literally make your client say, wow, I never knew that. Number four, build in opportunities for stories. Much better than facts, people remember stories. Stats say that well-told stories can increase recall by a whooping 26%. More importantly, stories make things much more interesting, especially if they are interesting themselves. Number five, your presentation should be curiosity driven. As we already remarked, education goes before selling. Just as well, facts go before explanations. 
Arouse the curiosity in your prospects by telling them the wow detail first and then following it with a clarification. Keep your audience in constant anticipation. Number six, think of each headline as valuable real estate. Don't use general headers. Be as specific as possible. Work to make every headline work hard for you. Seven, be confident, but not obnoxious. It is often confidence that determines success, but too much of it is a recipe for failure. So tread your ground carefully. You don't want to sound like a pretentious person. Nobody likes them. And number eight, focus on them, not on you. We all live our lives surrounded by mirrors. Becoming a good presenter, salesperson, trainer, or even a leader is about turning all of your mirrors into windows. The best way to learn your clients' needs is by listening to them and by asking them the right questions. Use your presentation to do that. Number nine, revisiting the dream 100, the nitty gritty of getting the best buyers. As we already mentioned in step number six, the Dream 100 effort is your plan of attack to penetrate your best buyers. In the words of Holmes, this is the fastest way to becoming the ultimate sales machine because these dream clients are the people or business that will buy your product or service faster, in greater quantities, and more frequently than any other buyers. Landing just a handful of these dream clients can have a seismic impact on your bottom line. The reason why Holmes decided to separate the nitty gritty of getting those best buyers from the theoretical explanation of who they are is because he believed that marketing and presenting are an essential part of the Dream 100 process. The process itself can be broken down to the following six steps. 1. Choose your dream 100. 2. Choose the gifts. 3. Create your dream 100 letters. 4. Create your dream 100 calendar. 5. Conduct dream 100 follow-up phone calls. And 6. Present the executive briefing and let's see what they mean in practice. The Dream 100 process begins with a market analysis. That's the only way you're going to find your ideal buyer. Next, you must wait for an opportunity, a national holiday, say, to surprise them with a small gift. Be aware that the gift must clearly express your care and interest, but should never qualify as a bribe. A Rubik's Cube or a paddle ball are great gift ideas of this kind. Whatever the gift, however, it must always be accompanied with a short, captivating letter tying the gift in some clever way. Just as in everything else, put strategy before tactics, even when penning your letter. Follow your gift with a friendly phone call. When the time's appropriate, say a few phone calls later, ask if you may do a presentation for the buyer. Do some research to discover what their biggest issue is and use this knowledge to prepare the primarily informative presentation. At the crucial moment, reveal your smoking gun and that is to say the piece of evidence that proves you can solve your buyer's main problem better than your competi competitors. Your goal at first should be to get just one ideal buyer. This should make it easier for you to get the next one. It wouldn't be long before you manage to double and triple your sales. Number 10, selling skills, training your sellers. Most companies leave too much of the sales process up to their individual salespeople. But would a conductor ever leave that much of the performance to their abilities of his violinist or his main pianist? Without proper training or even superstar sellers will seem average when their mood or attitude isn't at the level expected from them. As entrepreneur James Clear once remarked, nobody rises to the level of their goals. We all fall to the level of our systems. In other words, rather than just superstar sellers, you also need a selling system. 
To establish it, try implementing these few steps. 1. Establish rapport. Don't see your buyers as sources of your income only. See them as friends as well. If you are friends with your clients, other salespeople will have a more difficult time to take them away from you. To establish rapport, provide information that helps your client. Ask questions. Be funny and empath empathetic. And even more importantly, be a good supportive ear. Find a common ground. Number two, qualify the buyer. Qualifying buyer means finding out what they are looking for in your product or service and what factors will influence them to buy. Use questions to go as deep as possible. Number three, build value. Once you know your customer's buying criteria, it will be a lot easier to build value around your product or service. For now, be just informative and educational, not persuasive or persistent. Number four, create desire. Make your client want your product right now. Lead them through a series of questions and stories that will intensify their sense of need for your products and services. Present killer data and wow facts. Feign scarcity and urgency. Number five, overcome objections. Don't ever take no for an answer. For a superstar seller, an objection is never a setback, but an opportunity to close. So try isolating your client's objection by asking them questions in this kind. Is money the only thing standing between you and this product? If you could afford it, would you buy it? If the answer is yes, this is a great moment to mention a one-of-a-kind discount offer. 6. Close the sale. By isolating your client's objection one by one, you should be able to present the sale as a logical outcome. At this point, stop selling, help your prospect make the decision, hand him the pen. And number seven, follow up. The final step is following up. Staying close to your customers is so important that home's penultimate strategy for building the ultimate sales machine is precisely about it. So that's where we're heading next. Number 11, following up. How to keep clients forever. Follow up is not just the seventh step of every sale but it's also the most important one when it comes to recurring revenue. That's why you must consider your follow-up during every step of the sales process. As a rule, your follow-up will only be as good as your first six steps are. After closing the sale, these are the 10 steps you should follow to keep your client forever. Number one, send the first follow-up letter. Send a letter to your client within an hour or two of your meeting. Make them feel happy that, you've, that they bought from you. Two, make the first follow-up call. Not that long after sending the first follow-up letter, make the first follow-up call. Don't make this call about you and your company, but about your client and his problems and challenges. Number three, share something amusing. Selling, as we already said, isn't just about getting the money, but about establishing rapport with your client as well. So after you have closed a sale with an ideal buyer, start communicating properly with them. Send them a meme from time to time or something of personal interest. Once again, don't sell, just smoosh. Fourth, Throw a party, share a meal, and bond like crazy. Throwing a party is probably the best way to bond with your client. If that's financially draining, try to ease into your client's life by inviting them to a meal, breakfast, and lunch spell, good rapport, but dinner spells, lifetime customer. Five, send another email or letter or card. You must always be at the top of your customer's mind. And once you get there, you must never let go. So send something to your client, not just after a sale, but also after you shared a meal. Make it short and interesting. Number six, plan something fun that can include the family. 
Try inviting your clients to join you in fun activities such as boating, tennis, hot air ballooning, or scuba diving. The more experiences you share with them, the less likely it is that they will never leave you. 7. Offer something to help their business. Friendship is about giving much more than it is about getting. So once you've established a bond with your client, start treating them as you would be a friend. Tell them things that might be helpful to them. They will appreciate it and will certainly pay you back. 8. Send another email or letter or card. Keep sending follow-up notes and jokes to be permanently bonded. Your client needs to hear from you often. Number 9. Offer more help. By this step, you will have already become a trusted confidant to your clients. Hence, they will probably ask you to help them on an occasion or two. Don't decline it. And 10. Invite them to your home. When a client comes to your house or invites you to theirs, we are talking about an unbreakable bond. Needless to say, this is the ultimate follow-up. Number 12. All systems go. Setting goals and measuring effectiveness. As Peter Drucker, the godfather of management, remarked once famously, what gets measured gets managed, even when it's pointless to measure and manage it, and even if it harms the purpose of the organization to do so. In other words, tracking the numbers is not just important, but also vital. Without it, you won't know how well you're doing. However, even when, it, when you don't know how far you've come unless there are benchmarks, that is objectives which must be met. For this reason, goal setting and measuring effectiveness is the 12th and last core skill area of the ultimate sales machine. It's the one that soups up all 11 that come before it. Setting goals, in Holmes' explanation, is not simply about writing them periodically, although that is a part of it, but about mastering your focus so that achieving those goals happens quickly and automatically. Without goals, strategies don't exist. And without them, even when your tactics work, they may work for all the wrong reasons and in all the wrong directions. In Holmes' opinion, to master the art of setting goals, you must first master the art of positive thinking. And there are many self-help books that may help you achieve this. But the essence is that you can change your behaviors by merely changing your mindset. Well, the same holds true for every member of your company and your company itself. So, organize a goal-writing workshop Ask every one of your employees to write down their lifetime and their annual goals in addition to the desired annual outcome for the next five years. May they also write three things they will do each month to improve their life, their performance, their department, and the company in general. Post each of this list at an appropriate location so that everyone could see them often. Turn them into checklists so that you turn the realization of your dreams and the dreams of your employees into a friendly competition. Trust us, there will probably be no losers from the contest. Challenge your employees to be their best selves and they won't disappoint you. Thanks for listening. Join our online family by signing up for your free account at www.ownyourfamily.com and begin your journey to freedom. Want to get there faster? Book a strategy call with us at ownyourfamily.com forward slash book a call. As always, be sure to leave a rating and subscribe to our podcast and channel so you never miss a future episode.